Saint Petersburg, northern capital of Russia, city specially built by Peter the Great to be a window to Europe, becomes the greatest window to the world by the end of the 20th century in the former USSR. Saint Petersburg is the nation's largest commercial port center with the most important country borders, sea, land, and air. And where there is border, there is smuggling. Smuggling always existed in St. Petersburg, but with the collapse of the Soviet Empire, when the old boundaries became transparent and the new ones just started appearing on the maps, big-scale smuggling activities allowed the former Leningrad to claim the laurels of one of the largest smuggling centers of the world. Everything from oil and non-furious metals to jewelry and antiques brought to the West through Finland, the Baltic states, and Poland. Everything that black world market would digest. The smuggler job was one of the most popular jobs of the city. Law enforcement agencies hardly coped with the large number of experts in illegal trafficking of goods across the border, but only the small fry were imprisoned, such as intermediaries, carriers and couriers. The organizers as a rule were out of reach. They could work in the most serious institutions of the city, for example, in Smolny, former headquarters of the World Revolution and now St. Petersburg City Hall. On June 20th, 1993, urgent operational information came to the office of the Federal Counterintelligence Service of St. Petersburg and the region. 45,000 cans of black caviar were stolen from the fish factory in Volgograd. It was necessary to warn all custom transitions of the region about possible illicit transportation of the stolen caviar. Employees of Sobetsky Custom, through which considerable streams of cargo went to Western Europe, were well informed. June 26, the driver of one of the refrigerators presented documents with numbers seal affixed to them for the batch of black caviar. Custom officers remembered at once that two weeks earlier, the truck driver with contraband metal showed them the exact same seal. They ordered to drive the truck to the parking lot and decided the papers were St. Petersburg office. Since it was Sunday, the request didn't reach the headquarters. Suddenly, one of the officers, who was off that day, appeared on the parking lot. He asked about the cargo, looked at the documents, and ordered to let the refrigerator go. The caviar went to the west. The reply from St. Petersburg came on the next day. Forged documents, illegal cargo, but it was too late. By that time, the refrigerator already reached the border with Germany. Although the successful transportation of this batch could lull the vigilance of the smugglers, and they would soon send another shipment. Based on the custom declaration, the sender's name was established, but the specified firm was obviously a false one. The inspection of all its contacts surfaced the same name, a certain Igor Barkin. With the Procurator General's authorization, Barkin's home phone was tapped and field investigators received interesting information from one of the very first calls. The FSC agent surprised immensely when they found out that the smuggler was talking to the vice mayor of St. Petersburg, Lev Savinkov, who was in charge of the city trade issue. Therefore, formally speaking, there was no crime involved in their conversation. Simply, Barkinov, who appeared to be Savinkov's assistant, reported to the chief of a certain trading operation. The agents continued to conduct surveillance of Barkinov. After a while, they established that he bought a new batch of caviar and was ready to prepare it for shipment abroad. On September 8, 1993, in warehouse Lemrumba, the new refrigerator was loaded with boxes of black caviar. Barkinov, who is in charge of the operation, has prepared false declarations on cargo. Soon after, the smuggled girl arrived 
went to the customs warehouse. All the activities there were videotaped by the investigator. They noticed that the custom officer who was sealing up the car was suspiciously friendly with the smugglers. After he defined that some of the documents were filled incorrectly, he reprimanded crime partners for negligence in such serious business. The refrigerator, accompanied by cars with Barkinov's people in them, reached the border where the customs officers, the police, and FSC agents were waiting for them already. All the participants of operation were arrested, and over two tons of black caviar was confiscated. Barkanov and his brothers in crime knew exactly what they had lost. In any New York restaurant, one kilogram of black caviar would cost at least $1,500. Thus, for the whole batch, they could get over $3 million. As soon as Barkanov found out about the detention of the cargo, he went to Savinkov's office in Smolny to report about it. Since the listening devices were already installed in the vice mayor's office, the FSC agents heard incredible things during that conversation. Mentioned by Savinkov, Vladimir Kulin was a leader of the largest criminal gang in the city, so-called Tambovs. Was the vice mayor going to meet with the representative of the criminal world? This fact aroused agents' interest and they inquired the City Department of Internal Affairs. Whether Savrinkov was involved in any doubtful operations earlier, as it turned out, he was. Not long before the episode with Caviar, his name appeared in the well-known sugar scam. Sugar for St. Petersburg was bought for fabulously high prices by the city's officials and huge commission fee went to their pockets. However, Savinkov's complicity in it could not be proved at this time. However, the police department kept records in their archives of the phone conversations from the sugar case. And one of the interlocutors, there was also Lev Savinkov. Если мне удастся вот в ближайшие 10 дней, вот сейчас пройдет первая платежка, сегодня должна была пойти на 150 миллионов. То есть, чтобы всю сразу вот миллиард 200 не платить, потому что они будут долго идти, мы договорились по 150 миллионов в день. И если вот пройдут сегодня 150, за 10 дней это все закроется, я у тебя нажрусь, как с последняя собака. FCS agents began to find out how the man who controls various contraband activities through the regional border becomes the vice mayor of the city. Savinkov's biography shows some interesting facts. Lev Savinkov was born in 1950. After the army, he entered the prestigious Odessa State Maritime University, and after the graduation, he was assigned to work in one of the Leningrad Scientific Research Institutes, where he quickly started to build his career. But in the beginning of the 1980s, he leaves it all and gets a job as a store worker in a regular grocery store. Savinkov knew exactly what he was doing. Trade business in the Soviet era was the main driver of human relationships and the measure of all values. In eight years, Savinkov makes his career from the counter worker to the head of the trade department of Leningrad, the second city in the country. He gets the most desirable position in the commentary bureaucratic heredity. However, in 1991, with the beginning of the tumultuous business in the new Russia, he voluntarily resigns from his position, becomes one of the most successful businessmen of the city. One year later, he was again invited to the city's administrative work, but at that time, he was offered the position of vice mayor. Savinkov, who officially paid 600,000 in taxes in 1995, agreed to take a job with a salary of a few thousand rubles. 
He knew exactly what he was doing. This was absolutely clear about him. Quite obviously, he quit his billion dollar businesses for the sake of even bigger money. But how could he do it? Even if to assume that his share in legal export of black caviar was the biggest one, it is still only a few thousand dollars and a big risk of being caught, which does not justify the amount. What has this person who once again abruptly changed his life actually conceived? Assuming that the smuggling of black caviar is only part of the vice mayor's illegal activity. The agents decided not to detain him yet. They continued the surveillance, and pretty soon they have got new information. Сейчас образец, а потом пойдет поставка видео. Они так будут так. каждый день что-то приготавливать. Так, слушай, За это все надо вчера, платить. Я ему вчера сказал, говорит, для образцов это надо. Я говорю, что для вот когда пойдет, скажем, 100 грамм, нужно такие же документы. Да, я говорю, ну, получается абсолютно легально. The person who was managing tons of sugar and tens of tons of smuggled black caviar suddenly started to talk about grams of some samples. Why the interests of Lev Vitalovich became so small? What kind of documents which can legalize a product was mentioned in that conversation? FSC agents started an investigation. Zemikov's companion at this time was Alexander Medvedev, one of the largest businessmen of St. Petersburg, the owner of several export-import firms. Medvedev had a multi-visa to Germany, and field investigators found out that he intends to go to Berlin on one of those days. Usually he would fly to Germany, but this time he decided to travel by car. Moreover, he decided not to go by his Mercedes, but he borrowed modest Neva from his friends. This fact alerted investigators even more. Apparently, he was going to carry a load of something. Could it be drugs? On September 30th, 1993, Medvedev's white Neva appeared on the Russian-Finnish border While filling out the custom declaration and passing other formalities, Medvedev stayed calm and confident and even tried to joke with custom officers as usual. To his great surprise, they started thorough inspection of the car of just usual symbolic examination. They checked everything taped the body of the car, carefully examined each part, even the muffler and exhaust pipe. But didn't find anything suspicious. Medvedev remained solid and serene. Desperate to find anything, looking at each detail almost through magnifying glass, Customer officers glanced in the first aid kit, where a unusual set of medicines, they found three small bags with vials. Inside of each vial was black powder. Being good psychologists, custom officers noticed that Medvedev became nervous when they found a powder. Officers understood immediately that they were holding in their hands what they had searched for, but they didn't know what it was. They asked McVeigh. He showed big surprise on his face and replied that this was not his car and he doesn't know what the owners of it store in their first aid kit. At that moment, FSC agents stepped forward and started to ask questions, no longer hiding the surveillance camera. 
Those who searched and checked the first aid kit also asked me, what is it? I don't know what this is. Field investigators asked scientists, 8 grams of mysterious powder that has been found in first aid kit on the Russian Finnish border appeared to be extremely rare metal of the platinum group osium. To be exact, it's acetone. Osium-187 is used in the aerospace industry as well as for the manufacture of super expensive anti-cancer drugs. Only half a kilo of this element arrives to the world market in a year and its price reaches up to $20,000 per gram. That exceeds the price for gold and platinum in 10,000 times. Pure osseum not found in nature, and it is the field investigators generally surprised when they found out that eight grams of osseum was produced in the summer house laboratory of one of the most naturally gifted scientists of St. Petersburg, Victor Petr. Osseum 187, 99.8, is a height which was attained in the laboratory as a result of the three-year, three-year sweep in the mass separator. That is why this product is super expensive, because of the cost of labor invested. Do you see the price in here? $189,000 per gram, and today I got even higher purity, 99 0.96 and in large quantities. Victor Petrick didn't deny that he was producing enriched osseum when FSC agents arrived to his summer house with the inspection. He also informed them that several months ago he had a phone call from the vice mayor. The person who introduced himself as the vice mayor told him that he has learned on one of the scientific exhibitions of the existence of super expensive metal and asked if Petrick can produce its enriched isotope in his home laboratory. Petrick, who was very surprised and said that he will try, Samikov assured him that in case of a success of the experiment, the city government will organize the official expert at Osseum to the west and will use the money to transform St. Petersburg into one of the richest cities of the world. As for Patrick, he will get the best laboratory in the world and the Nobel Prize for certain. Savinkov was arrested in his office in Simone. Among other official papers during the search in Vice Mayor's office was found the Osseum quality certificates and business correspondence about the sale of black caviar to the West. However, Vice Mayor found quite normal explanation to all of that, including raw awesome material and brilliant scientists. Being a prudent owner and a father of the city, he could not pass a chance which promised him, in fact, to the city, billions of profits. I considered that we can get profit within 12 to 13 billion dollars a year. It is, by the way, makes three Leningrad budgets. Why then Osseum, with cost almost one million dollars, transported secretly, if all that was started in interest of the city? The vice mayor prepared the answer to this question as well. The customs code does not ban Osseum 187, which was hidden in the first aid kit. So what kind of contraband are we talking about here? Only for this reason, Salmon Kaufman Medea was released on bail shortly after their arrest. In less than a month, Medvedev went to London and didn't plan on coming back to Russia. Savinkov, who was confident that his case is unmistakably clear, continued going on questioning. The investigators on their side asked him new questions every time. For example, if he knew that transported osseum was estimated at $1 million, 
Why didn't he declare it? How then official philanthropists were going to extract the promised billions for city treasury? Why he financed ASEAN project from his own pocket? As it turns out, Semenkov indeed had money. During a search of his office, 10,000 US dollars, 2,000 German marks, and several million rubles had been withdrawn from his safe, not to mention numerous credit cards of the most prestigious European banks. But when field investigators arrived with a search warrant to Savinkov's apartment, they had found these absolute emptiness. The law-abiding benefactor didn't include the possibility of arrest and has deprived investigators in advance of concern for the inventory of his property. Finally, it was clear why the next sudden change occurred in Savinkov's destiny. While he was still the businessman, he learned about a miracle medal and has lost rest and sleep over it. He understood at once that ASEAN 187 can bring a lot of money, that this is when fate presented him with an incredible opportunity to work in the city hall. He had no doubt that the interesting work in a couple of years would transform this ruble in one million dollars. He started the fraud with a sweet but heavy sugar, continued smuggling, very elegant black caviar, and soon after the operation with graceful and very light Asiam. By the way, ideal illicit Asiam allowed Savinkov to solve another very important problem. For any illicit cargo passing through the custom points of St. Petersburg, it was necessary to unfasten not less than 10% of its value to the criminal Tambos group headed by Vladimir Kumulan. It was possible to save millions of dollars by arranging the export of invisible to Tambos group Asiam. Alas, it failed. He would have had thought of making a simple nut for Neva from eight grams of expensive metal. He would sit now in a more spacious office and would probably work over new inventions in science and technology. For example, over Victor Petrick's last brilliant invention, special powder for liquidation of oil spills and ecological disasters. Western experts estimate Made the cost of the patent for this invention in $8 billion. It took three years of investigation in order to enter a case of smuggling on an especially large scale and to bring the matter to court. Even on June 20th, 1997, on the day the sentence was announced, Savinkov was absolutely calm and he could not imagine that he would be found guilty. While well, Savinkov appealed the verdict trying to prove his innocence, the Federal Security Service had finished investigation of another sensational case connected with the detention of the largest consignment of drugs in post perestroika Russia, a ton of cocaine. The discovery which was made in this case did not surprise Sergei Yakovlev, the chief of of FFB investigation department. During the investigation of high profile and controversial criminal cases, which were in the procedure of our administration, we have come to a conclusion that the same individuals who assisted Sabakov with the smuggling of caviar and Asiam also participated in illegal import of a ton of cocaine on territory of Russia.